If you're like me and were raised on the American public school system, you were probably brought up thinking that the British Army during the American Revolution was an army of criminals taken from prisons, or that it was an army of conscripts consisting of the dregs of society, scooped off of their streets by unscrupulous recruiting parties and pressed into service against their will. You may have also heard stories regarding the practice of slipping coins into men's drinks and thereby tricking them into taking the king's shilling and enlisting them under false pretense. But in reality, the British Army of the late 18th century had no cause to resort to such trickery and unlawful practices because it was, first and foremost, a volunteer army, much the same as the present-day American military. Ask any veteran today why they served, and I guarantee that whatever answer they give, someone in the 18th century would have a similar answer. In this video, which is part of the History Matters collaboration between myself and a whole bunch of other fantastic channels that you should definitely check out, I hope to dispel many of the myths and misconceptions regarding the recruitment and training of the British Redcoat. But before I do that, we first need to ask ourselves, how did recruiting in the 18th century British Army actually work? The first thing to understand about recruitment in the British Army during the 18th century is that it was all done on the regimental level. During peacetime in the early 1770s, each regiment consisted of 10 companies, with each company consisting of a maximum of 36 private soldiers, for a total operational strength of roughly 300 men after factoring in the officers and the drummers. In 1775, the strength of each regiment was expanded, with an allotment of an additional 18 private soldiers per company, bringing the total operational strength of each regiment to around 500 men. Furthermore, you had the inclusion of two more of what were called additional companies, consisting of a small group of officers and dedicated NCOs. These additional companies would serve as recruiting parties and would be given the task of fanning out across the countryside and setting up camps outside of busy towns and industrial centers. Once there, they would begin the process of seeking out potential recruits, which, once drilled, would join the rest of the regiment wherever they happened to be in service. There was a set of criteria that these recruiting parties had to follow when they were seeking out potential enlistees. They weren't just looking for anybody. In particular, they were looking for men generally between the ages of 17 to 25, although there was some leeway given depending on the exact regiment but 17 to 25 is the recommended age range suggested by both Thomas Symes and Bennett Cuthbertson, two of arguably the most prevalent military writers of the day. They were looking for people who were able-bodied, meaning people who were physically able to carry a musket and march long distances and tolerate inclement conditions for long periods of time, and who were free of any visible deformities. Additionally, they were looking for people who were old enough to have worked in some form of trade other than the military. Trades were immensely valuable to the army because a regiment on campaign has to be self-sufficient to a degree, and if you're camped in the wilderness of North America, for example, things are going to break down, equipment is going to fail, clothes are going to be damaged, and when those things happen, you need people in the regiment who have experience in fixing these things. So if you were a blacksmith, a tailor, or a shoemaker, for example, Chances are, you had skills that the army wanted, but only if they deemed you to be of good character. And even then, it was still ultimately up to you whether or not you wanted to join. They couldn't just snatch you off the street and say, hey, guess what, you're in the army now. The recruiting parties of the 17th Regiment, for example, were specifically instructed not to use any villainies or low practices to entice or otherwise trick recruits into joining. So a typical enlistment would look something like this. A recruiting party would come to town, and then you, the prospective recruit, would approach a member of the party and express your desire to enlist. The party member would then take you to see the recruiting officer, who would ask you a series of questions, starting with your name, age, and where you were from, and if you were willing to serve the king. If satisfied with your answers, the recruiting officer would then measure your height, and from there would determine whether or not you were fit to serve. If he determined that you were, he would then give you an enlistment bounty, usually amounting to a few English guineas. You would then be sent to the recruiting party's camp to train with the rest of the recruits. John Robert Shaw of the 33rd Regiment described this recruitment process in detail in his An Autobiography of 30 Years, 
which covers his enlistment in the British Army, along with his eventual desertion in 1781. It is his testimony that allows us to have such a detailed understanding of the process. However, Shaw's narrative, as vivid as it is, actually misses out on a few key points in the enlistment process. He leaves out the crucial point of attestation. All recruits, after accepting their enlistment bounty, were legally required to appear before a magistrate within a set time of at least a day, but no more than four days, and attest that he had enlisted of his own volition. If they agreed, the recruitment process could continue. If not, they would be allowed to return to their normal life, after returning the enlistment bounty, of course. The magistrate would also conduct a background check on the recruit to ensure that they had no prior obligations that would prohibit them from enlisting. For instance, if they had an active apprenticeship, if they were a known criminal, or if they were already enlisted in another regiment or a local militia. If the check came back clean, the recruit was then free to proceed with the next phase of their enlistment. Training. Training would begin effective immediately, and it began with the most basic aspect of being a soldier, learning to act like one. Bennett Cuthbertson emphasizes the importance of expelling the clown from the gate and air of the new recruits. From Chapter 28, Article 2 of his book, It must be rendered familiar to every man to hold up his head, to stand quite upright and motionless, to cast his eyes to the right without the least appearance of a formal stiffness, and to turn out his toes, to march firm upon his feet, keeping his knees stiff, turning out and pointing his toes at the same time, to keep his body straight without leaning backwards, or pushing out his belly, to bring forward his chest and to draw his shoulders back, to face to the right and left and quite about, both standing and marching, to wheel in a proper manner, and to march in slow and quick time, in all of which recruits should be perfectly instructed and well trained before they are allowed to touch a firelock. The new recruits would also be taught the fundamentals of proper hygiene necessary for their health, and they would receive a knapsack, spare shirts, shoes, and stockings all paid for using the money from their enlistment bounty. They would not receive a full uniform until they were sent to a training depot, either in Chatham, Portsmouth, or Cork, Ireland. And even then, it would only consist of a cap, jacket, a sort of sleeved waistcoat, and trousers. New regimentals were only issued once a year, so the recruits would have to wear these temporary uniforms until whenever the next shipment of regimentals came in. Roger Lamb, who enlisted in the 9th Regiment in 1773, describes his training, albeit briefly, but his account corroborates many of Cuthbertson's recommendations. On the 24th, I joined the regiment and was put into the hands of a drill sergeant and taught to walk and step out like a soldier. This was at first a disagreeable task to me. However, having at last rectified the most prominent appearance of my awkwardness, I received a set of accoutrements and a firelock and was marched every morning from the barracks to the bowling green, near the waterside, to be instructed in the manual exercise. As Lamb demonstrates, it was not until recruits had totally mastered the fundamentals of being able to stand and march as a soldier that they would finally be entrusted with the use of a musket, and even then, pains would be taken to ensure that they understood all aspects of the manual of arms before they moved on to learning the firing sequence and drilling with powder. When learning the firing sequence, Cuthbertson recommends to start the recruits on charges with powder only. Guns that use a black powder ignition source produce a lot of sparks and smoke when the piece is discharged, so the idea was to get the recruits accustomed to its effects before moving on to firing with live rounds, although in peacetime firing live ammunition was rare. They would start off by firing singly so that the NCO in charge could more easily watch their every move and correct any mistakes. They would then move on to firing in pairs before eventually working their way up to firing as a whole block. Training was intensive, but regiments were instructed not to overwhelm the recruits or treat them too harshly, lest they become disillusioned with the service and leave. So, sorry Sergeant Lynch, but you're doing it wrong. As for the exact amount of time that these new recruits spent learning the exercise, it was common for them to spend anywhere from at least six months to two years in training. So when they finally did embark for America, the recruits would have had, in theory, a substantial amount of training under their belts already. It wasn't like they were just tossing green recruits onto ships and getting them stuck into the fray with scarcely any clue as to what was going on. At least, that was the idea. But the reality, as Matthew Spring points out in With Seal and With Bayonets Only, was that regiments were commonly spread so far and wide due to peacetime civil commitments that they could not drill in large concentrations, 
which meant that new recruits frequently received only very rudimentary training, which meant that these recruits still had to be trained extensively upon their arrival in the colonies, and they would have had to have been anyway, regardless of how much training they received before being deployed, because the reality of combat in North America was very different compared to the parade grounds of Europe. Now that we've covered the recruitment and training process, let's look more closely at some of the more common misconceptions that I touched on briefly during the introduction to this video. You may have got the impression while watching this video conscription did not happen in the British Army during the American Revolution, which isn't strictly true. It did happen, just not nearly to the extent that you might imagine. Unlike parts in the 20th century, like the Vietnam War, in which 25% of American soldiers were draftees, in the Revolutionary War era British Army, conscripts made up less than 1% of the entire army. At the start of the war in 1775, conscription was actually not legal. It wasn't until 1778... Oh, hi Merlin. Do you want to be in the video? It wasn't until 1778 when the Recruiting Act was passed that conscription became allowed. And even then, it was only under very specific provisions. Per the Act, justices of the peace were allowed to deliver to recruiting officers all able-bodied and disorderly per, <laughs> per the act, justices of the peace were allowed to deliver to recruiting officers all able-bodied, idle, and disorderly persons who could not, upon examination, prove themselves to exercise and industriously follow some lawful trade or employment, or to have some substance sufficient for their support and maintenance. So again, this means they weren't just pulling anyone off the street. It was only disorderly persons who could not provide proof of some other form of employment. And even then, the idea wasn't so much to boost recruitment numbers via direct conscription, but more to passively boost the number of recruits who enlisted voluntarily as an alternative to conscription, since enlisting voluntarily gave you more say as to which regiment you ended up in. This act proved to be unpopular, however, and in 1780, it was repealed. As it turns out, people who enlist under duress are more likely to desert, and people who are more likely to desert are not particularly useful to the army. The idea of press gangs in the army is also outdated. Press gangs were more of a navy fixture, and even then, this idea that they would go around impressing anybody that they came across into naval service is erroneous. If you were a sailor in the 18th century, you were already sort of a freelance agent, and the Navy was specifically only looking for people who were already familiar with the trade. The exact language of the period specifically mentions seeking eligible men of seafaring habits. So they were looking specifically for sailors who weren't actively working at the time. They didn't want just anybody. In the same way that the Army, as well, was somewhat picky about who they did and did not enlist. There's also the matter of enlisting criminals into the army. Popular culture has given people the impression that it was common practice to do so, but in reality it was just the opposite. People convicted of certain crimes, like petty theft for example, may have been given the option of joining the army under a pardon as an alternative to serving out a jail sentence. Those convicted of major crimes, like murder for example, would probably not be extended the same option however, and even if they were, the army most likely would not take them. Remember that they were more interested in men of good character. They wanted people whom they thought would be trustworthy, and nobody particularly wants to be in the ranks with a convicted felon. Even then, however, very few pardons were issued. Only 1764 in England and Wales throughout the entire duration of the American War, versus the hundreds of times more recruits who were enlisted through more traditional means. I feel I must also address the issue of the popular image of the unscrupulous recruiting sergeant. Recruiting sergeants are often portrayed as being these unsavory characters who preyed on unsuspecting drunks in taverns, enlisting men by nefarious means, such as slipping a shilling into their drink or stuffing one into their hand when going in for a handshake and therefore tricking them into accepting the king's shilling. The prevalence of this misconception is probably due in part to the tendency for caricatures and paintings of the period to depict recruiting scenes primarily taking place outside of taverns, owing to the assumption that a majority of recruits must have been drunk at the time of their enlistment, and therefore easy to manipulate. And this image is not entirely without merit, because there are accounts from soldiers who claimed to have been drunk at the time of their enlistment. This is, however, part of the reason why attestation was a legal requirement, and why there was a grace period of a few days before a prospective recruit was required to appear before the magistrate. 
It gave them time to sober up and mull over their decision. It wasn't a perfect system, however, and there certainly were ways to exploit it. Such was the case with George Hartley, who was actually a veteran who had been discharged from the army in 1777, only to fall in with a recruiting party in London who got him drunk and then immediately had him appear before a magistrate while still intoxicated. Accounts like Hartley's, however, should still be treated as the exception and not the rule. I also believe the tendency to depict recruiting sergeants as unscrupulous probably has less to do with their actions than it does with their words. John Robert Shaw, when he was being taken to see the recruiting officer for his regiment, was literally told that he would be shown the place where the streets are paved with pancakes. An obvious exaggeration meant to hype up the idea of army life. Recruiting posters of the period also advertise military life as being rather glamorous, and they employ judicious use of words like heroes to sell people on this idea that military life might offer them some standing. Remember that the target demographic is primarily working class people. Of course, in actuality, military service in the 18th century was not at all glamorous, and the general public was not blind to this. One satirical print by James Gilray, dated June 1793, depicts a soldier returning home broken and battered from war, almost unrecognizable to his horrified family who have been left destitute from his absence. And warfare back then, as it still does today, could indeed have a lasting physical and mental toll on soldiers. That was the reality of soldiering for a great many people. Enlisting as a soldier meant giving up on whatever prospects you may have had and leaving behind your family and loved ones with the very real possibility that you might never return or become permanently disfigured. And for what? A consistent but meager wage and cramped living conditions. Some might say that's not exactly a good deal. So looking again at these caricatures, let's pay particularly close attention not to the recruiting officers, but to the prospective recruits. You'll notice that they're very rarely depicted in a flattering manner. In fact, they're almost always depicted as rubes. I'd argue that ultimately, these depictions say less about the conduct of recruiting parties and more about the 18th century public opinion towards soldiering in general. Even the more serious depictions of recruiting scenes tend to have a melancholy atmosphere about them, especially this painting by John Collett, circa 1767. In this, we see that there is a young woman clinging to the arm of the prospective recruit as though begging him not to go. Note also the older woman in the left of the frame, who seems to be looking on with contempt as if she's seen this exact scenario play out many times before. From this painting especially, I get a sense of quiet resignation that this man is throwing his life away while, all around him, life goes on. Similar scenes can also be found in other works from the period, including Collett's more satirical work, The Manchester Hero, but also in this 1770 print by an unknown artist and this watercolor by Samuel Grimm. Note that in all of them, there is a young woman clinging to the arm of the recruit as if to convince him of his folly. And note as well that the prospective recruits in nearly all of these prints are drawn in such a way as to make them appear gullible, hapless, oblivious, or in most cases, just downright stupid. There is not much sympathy extended to them at all. All of these illustrations basically scream, if you join the army, you're an idiot. And no thought is given to the myriad of very valid reasons that one might have for wanting to join the army. Whether it was a sense of patriotism, wanderlust, wanting to escape a bad family situation, or simply a desire for some form of stability, nearly all British soldiers who served during this period did so for very personal and practical reasons. But they're commonly depicted as easily misled simpletons. Perhaps it's no wonder, then, that so many misconceptions about their recruitment and training have survived into the current day. And I believe that these misconceptions are damaging to our understanding of the period. I can only hope that, in making this video, I have enlightened some people to the true nature of who these soldiers actually were, and that they were indeed part of a highly capable fighting force. For those wishing to gain further insight, I highly recommend checking out the works of Don Haggist and Matthew Spring, two great authors whom, without their extensive research, this video would have been monumentally more difficult to produce. Before I leave, I should once again mention that this video has been brought to you as part of the History Matters collaboration, which features a whole bunch of other channels, all covering similar topics. So if you enjoyed this content and want to see more like it, check out the playlist, which should be appearing somewhere on the screen right about now.
That being said, I hope you found this video informative and interesting. If you did, leave a like and a comment down below. Let me know. Subscribe if you haven't done so already. And as always, God save the king. Thank <laughs> you.